technology and scientific superstition. So I'm going to talk very fast indeed. I'm going to talk very fast indeed. Now, not everybody is native speaker. I know. So if anyone doesn't understand, please raise your hand. I'm going to talk about two historical examples of when techniques from outside of Occidental medicine were analysed by uh, Occidental medics, and I'm going to look at what they missed. So what my point is that, from a scientific perspective, there's a whole lot which you miss when you're looking at ayahuasca. And I want to have a look at some of the old mistakes that were made in the 19th century, and hopefully we can try not to do them again. The first thing we're going to talk about is Chinese medicine in Australia. Now this is diphtheria, and it killed one in 2,000 people. And there were lots of different ways of treating this in Australia. Allopathic medicine, homeopathic medicine, Aboriginal medicine, and Chinese medicine, which involved basically blowing a powder down the throat of uh, whoever had diphtheria. Diphtheria is uh, it clogs up the, the throat. But a gentleman sent word to the um, authorities in Australia saying there was a gentleman called Arsu who had cured 30 children with his technique. And there were other Chinese medics doing the same thing. Now, this went to another a right honourable gentleman. The right honourable gentleman um, suggested that Arsu himself go and perform a trial and he'd be watched by Western medics but they don't interfere. What actually happened, in the end, was a, 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 a package of powder got sent to these Western medics uh, and they analysed it with the tools of their time and the concepts of their time and they found that they had musk, camphor, potash, copper sulphate, nitrate of potash, zinc sulphate and carbonate of lime. Dr Blair was the scientist looking at it and his expert technical interpretation of the facts were, were the Chinaman's powder contains nothing new. <laughs> Um, these things necessarily act as astringent caustics, I can't pronounce that word, in the hands of an ignorant man, these local applications would, would be productive of a grievous amount of harm. Arsu is an ignorant pretender. Right, so we've got three things, uh, three points there which we're going to come back to. Uh, one is uh, the analysis of something, the analysis of a chemical, breaking it down to a chemical, rather than it's a whole mix. The other thing is uh, how we understand how a chemical works, and the third thing is what we understand of their uh, different knowledge system, which is not academic and not scientific. This is what um, Arsu's knowledge system was, and what's very important in that is the Fa Fu Feng Ji. And I don't know what that is, and I don't imagine that Dr. Blair knew what that is either. Um, so let's move on to mesmerism. <coughs> Mesmer himself, in the end of the 18th century, um, kind of, uh, pro he, he wore a long cape and he, he worked in perfumed parlours in Paris throwing women in, into fits, according to the people who were criticising him. Um, he also had some therapeutic successes. Uh, Louis the, I think, 14th, organised a commission into mesmerism, and, and um, the results of this commission were that we can't see this invisible fluid. Therefore, it's complete humbug. And there was a secret report issued which said that mesmerism may disrupt public morality, right? So there's a few parallels with ayahuasca research there as well, you know? There's all kinds of stuff we can't see, therefore we're going to give it any credence, uh, and it will, might well disrupt public morality. Mesmeric amputation, so, so mesmerism kind of fell out of fashion really, but then some years later, a man called John Elliotson picked it, picked it up, and he was the founder of the uh, uh, University College of Medicine, London, London Medical School. And he was uh, also the, the pioneer of the stethoscope, and he was the president of the Royal Society. And he presented to the Royal Society an account of a mesmerized man having his leg amputated. The learned opinion was, Dr. Elliotson, you must be mistaken, or the man was trained not to flinch. Whilst the other thing, I think. Um, James Epstel. <laughs> Oh, um, Finch. James Edsdale continued, or Elliotson continued teaching uh, mesmeric amputation and studying it, and he lost his university post. James Edsdale was a student of his who worked in Calcutta. He was a hospital supervisor in Calcutta. Performed over a thousand operations on uh, people who are hypnotized, including amputations of penises, legs, and cataracts. The learned um, opinion was that uh, he was either mistaken or the weak-minded Hindu was easily tricked. Um, this is amputation that was non-mesmeric amputation at the time. It had a mortality rate of 40 to 50 percent. Esdale had a mortality rate of 5 percent. So, the point I want to make here is that an epistemic object, what Foucault called a discourse object, cannot be properly analysed outside of its 
uh, cultural matrix. Mm -hmm. Right? We're going to come back to that. Ayahuasca in the lab, so ayahuasca is analyzed in the lab, how does it cultural matrix? Uh, to have DMT harmonine, harmonine, and tetrahydroharmonine, and these are various things. The language we have to explain them has been taken from abnormal psychology, and I know that we're trying to get away from that, but it does limit the kind of things we look for, in a way. Psychosomimetic, hallucinogenic, psychedelic. I now want to talk about a few differences between uh, practice, one well, I'm a dimister, so I want to talk about a few key differences in the way dimisters do things, and what, what I'm going to call the shamanic uh, system, and uh, as opposed to how scientists and academics and I want to make very clear that I'm not um, trying to say that the scientific perspective doesn't have value. I'm saying it doesn't have universal value. So one of the things to talk about here is a group therapy session. Uh, we talked about that a lot yesterday, so I'm not going to dwell on it. Um, but in the jungle, there is uh, privacy. You keep your mouth quiet. You make your mouth shut about what you've, what you've seen, and, and, except in very exceptional circumstances. And that's a problem for uh, analysis uh, in scientific uh, circles. How do, you, how do you work out what's going on? Maybe, I don't know, um, Maybe it's very difficult to analyze at the time, or you can analyze six months later, or... I don't know the answer to the questions, so I'm going to raise some questions. Uh, statistical analysis, right? In analysis, we normalize data, so we try and get rid of freak results, right? In, um, in the jungle, the freak result is an interesting result. Uh, and this is what I'm talking about, significance. We have statistical significance, and we also have personal significance, right? It's very important, uh, how, do we, how do we translate between those two things? So a freak result, for example, would be, uh, well, in my case, I had a disease which uh, doctors told me I would not be able to cure with uh, natural results and uh, uh, with natural medicines. And I listened to, well, I drank a glass of daimi, and I ignored all the doctors, all the homeopaths and everyone around me. And I also took some advice from a 400-year-old slave incorporated into the body of a middle-aged uh, woman at a barquinha term. Um, and the result was I'm still alive, I have this disease that was meant to eat my nose and my ears, and um, I'll show you my scar later. But um, this is significant for me, if it's not significant for the scientific community, we have to work out how to translate that significance. Um, right, so here's a few clinical conditions, the shamanic conditions. So in, the, in, the, in, in the lab, what's very important is the dosage, you know, how, you know getting exactly the right doses, it doesn't know, have, a, have a microgram or whatever it is. In the, in the shamanic system, it's the dosa. The guy is actually giving the, the brew, which is much more important than how much he's giving. Purity of the drug rather, oh, versus the purity of the guy who's giving the brew again. Um, uh, clinical conditions. In, in, in the church, we make sure we do this for myself, pass incense in all, in all the areas. So that's a, uh, a difference there. This is probably most interesting. In the lab, you try and isolate factors. So you might isolate down to ayahuasca or even down to some of the uh, constituents of ayahuasca. In kind of shamanic ceremony, there's all kinds of conditions which get piled on and piled on and piled on. So how do we analyze which is important? Uh, like, for example, in my own cure, my own cura, um, I was drinking a lot of ayahuasca, a lot of daimi. In fact, I was drinking it every day um, for four months. But I was also using bark, uh, diets, a whole load of different things and doing a lot of prayer, right? Um, <coughs> right, so other differences, we talk about spiritual hygiene, that's things like praying every day in the morning, doesn't really make very much sense to the, in the laboratory. And reverence to the brew itself, you know, when, I, when, when you hear people talking about their MDMA capsule, they don't really talk about it in the same, they don't, they don't produce it with the same um, ritual, degree of respect, silence, prayer, all this kind of thing. The phase of the moon, now, that's one of those things like, um, like mesmeric, like, like in mesmerism, until we can't see it. You know, there's no obvious effects in the, of the, moon, of the moon phase, although there is some research in uh, the amount of uh, drugs being used in um, um, psychedelic, not psychedelic, <laughs> psychiatric <laughs> units at the, uh, at the uh, moon, at the, at the full moon. Uh, menstruation, <laughs> vomiting, what's the right dose? Do you give someone a dose that makes them vomit? Uh, or not? You know, that's a consideration, because in one system it's important. Uh, uniform, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, collapse, when someone collapses, do you leave him on the floor like we do in the dining and dance around him? Or do you pick him up in his chair? Uh, now, it's interesting, if someone hears voices in the dining ceremony, that's very interesting. Oh, what did they say? Now, in a lab, or in a clinical situation, if someone hears voices, that's pathology, right? No, uh, not necessarily. No? Okay. Uh, good. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. Um, so, come back to that thing about significance, right? Uh, Language of abnormal psychology versus language of theology. Now, theology is not really very welcome amongst academics, uh, and I think that's a little bit of a, a failing there. 
if only because um, only because there's uh, it has a language of its own, yeah. right? Uh, especially spirit versus the bottom sort of vision versus the uh, primary narcissism versus the infinite dissociation versus mediumship, right? This is the training which someone else already talked about, um, personal training, and you see my 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 study of ayahuasca is basically most of it taking place dancing from side to side for between five and seventeen hours once a month or so. Uh, which is different to the kind of um, study that we've all done. Now, if we're talking about, you know, we're going to put a, a, an Indian shaman into an MRI scanner, you're going to put him in there, you know, that's a very cool way of studying him, but let's, let's do the reverse. Let's make sure we get involved in these traditions, study them from the inside, and try and, and, try, try, and, try and appreciate what, what the initiation is about. Uh, here's some, some, some areas where shamans and pyramids are doing the same thing. What uh, Jung and but Jung and Freud talked about making the unconscious conscious. So we are no. No, I know. I'm not. No, no, I'm not. I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm saying that um, there is a point of contact, and the, the point of contact I'm saying is that shamans mediate between the individual and the spiritual world, or the invisible world. There's a certain body of knowledge which they are said to have like psychologists are sent to have about how the unconscious works. So there is a point of overlap, we can talk about it later, but I think there's a point of overlap between what shamans do and what therapists do. What is the goal, right? Um, this is um, important, right? So let's talk about the cluster headache research. Very interesting. Uh, there's only two medicines which were discovered which can treat cluster headaches. You know what cluster headaches are? Right. So psilocybin was one, LSD was the other. So this was very interesting for pharmaceutical companies whose goal was to take away the cluster headaches. They also discovered bromo LSD, which is, has two advantages of LSD. One, it's not psychedelic. It still treats cluster headaches, but one, it's not psychedelic. And two, it can be patented, and therefore it can be sold uh, profitably. Now, what's the goal of shamanic practice? Ayahuasca means the vine of the soul, the vine of the spirit. Right, uh, and this is what Rick, Rick Strassman said. One of the most surprising aspects of the study was the frequency with which people would describe contact with the identities that were conscious of oh, them and integrated with them within this strange space. So how are we going to deal with this, right? I'm going to tell a very quick story about myself, because I've only had one migraine uh, in my life, and that was uh, immediately after, or well, the day after, doing one of the only group magic uh, ceremonies I did. It was on my first, and it was definitely the last, because it was extremely painful, this migraine I had afterwards. And then six years later, I kind of, it went, you know, it lasted for half a day, and about six years later I then went and started doing a, a mediumship course. And one of the first things that happened was a kind of recurrence of this migraine at much lower intensity. Oh, well, that's very interesting. I told the teacher, and he said, oh, I see. But he didn't really explain it, and there are many, uh, but this kind of point of, 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 of this touch, I learned later through drinking diamine, that someone told me once that, that certain spirits, when they come in contact, the, 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 the beneficial ones, if you like, or the evolved ones, they always ring the doorbell before they arrive. They always knock on the door. They don't arrive with urgency, right? This is some spiritualist knowledge or some shamanic knowledge. Um, and, and this kind of pain uh, can be a kind of uh, a knock on the door. And you often hear this with shamans. They suffer diseases and they have kind of things they have to go through, which is part of their calling to be a shaman. Right? So this is a different perspective and a different goal, right? Are we talking about, you know, if we, I think it's something relative to think, uh, relevant to think about what the goal of our thing is, why the spirit there is. <laughs> um, so the conclusions, mesmerism, um, there it is again, um, uh, mesmerism, um, we saw that what was invisible was inadmissible. Now, in the case of mesmerism, that perhaps crippled the, for a while the scientific project. You know, that was, that, was a, 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 that was a problem, I think. We have to look at efficacy, right? Uh, in, in, because the point I want to make is that shamanic things can be tested and are testable. Um, I think perhaps what this gentleman was saying. In, in a way, like in, in my case, I got a very clear message from a brew, which was against all the advice of the doctors that I was not, that I was not going to take injections of heavy metal into my veins and I was going to drink my ayahuasca. Now, for me, that's a test. And I have two friends who have who had similar uh, death sentences put upon them by doctors. He says, you're going to die if you put a cancer if you don't do this, I'm finishing stuff. So I, I, I think that's, that there are ways to test within the empirical study of, uh, of magic and of, of shaman. Morality, control issues. Yeah, this is, uh, this is coming up to a freak result. This guy, Esdale, who was doing the Calcutta um, operations, he said that with one patient, he was so connected 
on a, uh, from his mesmerism that he could actually just think about him when he was in another room and the guy would fall asleep in his curry. Now this obviously, these kind of things don't get included into journals, don't get included into write-ups. So there's kind of a censorship, a censorship at all levels of the kind of scientific unity. People censor their own work that they're going to send in, the journals censor the work that, you know, by, by what they print. Right? TCM, the epistemological object, we talked about that already, you know, is it, is it just harming and harming? No. breaking it down and assigning roles to chemicals and ignoring indigenous knowledge. Now, what, what, I, what I talk about indi- ignoring indigenous knowledge, if, we, if they're studying, if they, if for however long it is, they thought the moon is very important, and going into the diamine as well, the diamistas think that the phase of the moon is very important, why, you know, should that not be a field of study for us in the academy and in the lab as well? And uh, that's all I wanted to say. Really, actually, uh, there's one more thing I would just want to say. I would, I would have talked to some, some stories from, from the 20th century rather than the 19th century, but the science there is still a bit, um, I mean, you probably wouldn't believe me, uh, but it's on that website. If there's a chapter called The Church of Science which talks about some of those. Thank you, Danny.